gathered this morning for the worship of Almighty God. We gather firm in the conviction that as we draw near to God through Christ this morning, that God himself will draw near to us through his Son as well, and that we will meet with him here at this place and in this time of worship. If you're visiting here this morning, here or online, we do bid you the warmest word of welcome. We're delighted you're here, and we pray it'll be good for your soul as you draw near to God with us. And if you have any questions about First Presbyterian Church, our ministry, who we are, what we believe, how you can become a member here, I'll be at the door afterwards, and we'll be delighted to speak with you um, if you have any questions. If, if I could ask you please to pass the friendship register down the pew toward the middle and sign that as you do, it really helps us as elders to keep um, dibs on our members and on our visitors and see who's attending as we pray for you each week. This morning we extend our deepest Christian sympathy to Michael Smith on the death of his father, Grady Smith, who passed away this week on Tuesday, April the second. And then just yesterday as well, we pass our, 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 our sympathy, our love to Ken and Kathy Wingate and Vicky and Craig Wilkes on the death of Ken and Vicky's mother, Peggy Wingate Benson, who died on Saturday morning, April the 6th, just yesterday. And to both of these families, we want you to know that we're praying for you, that the Lord looks down with compassion. Christ wept at the tomb of Lazarus. The death of his people is precious to him because they are precious to him. And he is touched with a feeling with us of our infirmities and of our grief. Even though they're, they're not lost to him, they've been gathered into his eternal embrace. He's brought them home to God the Father. Yet... He feels the pain and the absence that we feel here on earth as we bid adieu to our parents and send them on in faith and hope and love into eternity. Some other quick announcements for our, for our upcoming ministry. We have our VBS planned this summer, June 10 to 14. And if you're thinking about that for your children, we'd love to have your children there in the summer. You can find information where you can serve and where your children can, I trust, be blessed on our church website and app. And this year, last week, we took up our sacrificial Easter offering to support several key ministries that we lean into around the world. And our goal this year was $150,000. We haven't quite reached that yet. And um, I want to encourage you as, you, as you as you prayerfully consider how the Lord may enable you to give that we might better support the work of the gospel um, around the world. I was, just came back from Briarwood, uh, and they, they set a goal for their, week, for their yearly missions conference of $2.2 million above and beyond the tithe, and they actually raised $2.7 million, which was an amazing achievement by the congregation, especially in such times as this. And I want to encourage us as a congregation, we have the great privilege, if we can't go to the mission field, we can serve our brothers and sisters by, provo by providing for their need according to the riches that God has given us here in Colombia. Well, with that said, as we prepare our hearts for worship, let's take a brief moment to still ourselves in the presence of God as we await his presence. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love toward us, and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Praise the Lord. Well, let us praise the Lord together this morning. We'll begin by singing hymn number 420 at the Lamb's High Feast, we sing.
Lord, we gather this morning to bring you our praise, our, our hymns of, of glorious praise unto you. For indeed, Christ has brought us from darkness to light, from death to life, by the power of his redeeming grace. For through his sacrifice, his blood that was shed, his body broken for us, your love, O oh God, was put on full display so that sinners like us would know the joy and hope and peace that can only come from you. And so, Lord, as we worship you this day, we pray that we would give you the praise that is due to you, our victorious King. We lift up our hearts, our voices, and ask, Lord, that you would enable us to declare your praise, to rejoice in the reality that you, Lord, do indeed reign. And that it is by your grace that we know the, the joy, the hope of eternal life with you. Help us to celebrate and to rejoice in that this day. And we come in the name of Christ, our risen Lord, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to now, dear Christians, as we gather, let us confess what we believe together as is written in our bulletins from the Apostles' Creed. I ask you, dear Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty. continue to worship our God together through the giving of our tithes and offerings.
God and our Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We thank you for a Savior who comes into this world to seek and to save that which is lost. Draw near to us now, O God, in the power of Christ, and speak to us that our hearts might be lifted up to Jesus and drawn near to the water of life to satisfy our hearts forevermore. In Jesus' name, amen. And amen. Please take your seats, and if you would, turn with me in your copy of the Word of God to John's Gospel and chapter 4. And as you do there, let me just quickly say to you all, um, I didn't mean to compare you all with Briarwood this morning and their uh, prodigious generosity. God's people never have a finance problem. It's either a heart problem or a vision problem. And I'm quite sure you have no heart problem. The heart here is, is solid and warm and vibrant. And so whenever a congregation fails to to meet your fundraising goal, it's always a sign to me as a pastor that I need to do a better job of casting the vision of missions before you, not just in the generality of the gospel and Christ's determination to win the world for his Father's glory and into his Father's kingdom, but also to set before you the particularity of the various needs that we're seeking to supply. Because I have no doubt if we do that, you will rise to the occasion and meet the, the goal And so I put the stress much more in me as senior minister and my responsibility to to inspire you to reach the vision because I have no doubt the heart is there as you've displayed and many times before through our ministry together in this place. Well, if you would, please turn with me in your copy of the Word of God to John's Gospel and chapter 4. I'm going to read, we're going to read a good chunk of this chapter during the sermon, so let me just read some key verses as we make our way toward the sermon. This is the Word of God. Please take heed how you hear. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away from the city, or way into the city, to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Amen. The grass withers and the flower falls off, but the word of God endures forever. Well, we live in a thirsty world full of thirsty people, all longing for satisfaction, all longing for one of Mr. Willy Wonker's everlasting gobstoppers. Remember, boys and girls, the everlasting gobstoppers that you could suck them forever and they would never get smaller and they would never lose their taste. Most gobstoppers aren't like that. You suck them and they shrink and you suck them and they become more than a little bit bland. And those gobstoppers, you remember in the story, were designed for boys and girls who didn't have very much pocket money. And I wonder, have you found an everlasting gobstopper, something that will keep its flavor and never grow dull, will never run out, that will satisfy you forever? Where can such a gobstopper be found? Isn't it true that our search for satisfaction in life, and whoever you are this morning, you're all united here, whether you're a member of this church or not, whether you're a Christian or not, we're all united as human beings in a search for satisfaction. But satisfaction almost always seems just around the next corner, just over the next hill. It's like the azaleas in springtime. They bloom and it's wonderful, But it doesn't take very long before the blooms begin to fade and the flowers begin to fail and they fall off and you're left back again with a bit of a drab bush. (laughs) 
Wouldn't it be wonderful if it could be springtime all the time? And the azaleas would always bloom. And those brief moments of satisfaction where we find ourselves saying, oh, this is the life would last forever. Where are you at this morning in your soul's search for satisfaction? How are you doing? Maybe a young person, a young optimist, enjoying the heady days of youth. And you see your whole life lying ahead of you, a smorgasbord of opportunities. You have your dreams and you have not yet lived long enough for them to become more than a few nightmares. And you're confident, I'll find satisfaction in life. You're like the girl in Starbucks one time when I was waiting for my coffee, I was three or four punters back in the line and the girl was talking in Savannah with the the lady ahead of me and she was talking about the, the Powerball jackpot. I forget how many hundreds of millions of dollars they were up for grabs, but it was a record. And she was fantasizing about what she would do if she won the Powerball jackpot. And I couldn't resist. I, I said from the middle of the line, you know, there's one thing money can't buy. And she said, oh, what's that? And before I could answer, an old man behind me in the, pu- in the, in the line said, happiness. And she said, oh, I know, she said, but I'd love the chance to prove the cynics wrong, she said. (laughs) Or maybe you're more of a middle-aged realist. You're not quite over the hill, but the view sure is great. And you remember when you used to think like that barista, and you've lived long enough for life to catch you with a few thunderous left hooks, you're not, you're not on, on the ground, on the canvas, you're still on your feet, but you're trying to kind of make it through and you're, you're of a more kind of philosophical philosophy. You say, well, when the azaleas bloom, I'll enjoy them, but not too much. And then when they're green and drab, I'll water them and prune them and wait for them for the next year's spring. Or maybe you're an old cynic You've reached that age where fun is a lot more work and work is a lot less fun. You're not a pessimist, you're an optimist with experience. Your glass isn't half full, it's just twice as big as you'd like it was, like it to be. And life has become difficult You live in a world with dashed hopes and disappointed dreams and maybe more than a few dry or dull, wet Wednesday afternoons. And you're just kind of a bit of a, well, a bit of a curmudgeon. Well, this morning in our text, we come before a savior, a person with a promise. He says in verse 13, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. I preach to you this morning the hound of heaven who's searching for a woman and beyond her a town and he's hungry to give them everlasting life and to satisfy the souls, their souls through time and eternity. And while I'm telling you about him and her this morning, he's really after you. He wants to catch you. He wants to give you life in abundance. Have you found him? Has he found you? Can you say, I'm thirsty no more? Are you still on the wrong end of Augustine's great quote? Remember Augustine said, Thou hast made us for thyself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. Have you found your rest in me, Jesus says this morning? I want you to see three things about Christ in our text this morning. 
First of all, he's willing to chase you down in order to satisfy you. Secondly, we'll see he's willing to call you out. He's got to call out all of the bolt holes you and I run to to try and find satisfaction where it can't be found. And lastly and briefly, we'll see he's willing to fill you up. He's willing to leave you like this woman satisfied. She leaves her water pot at the well and goes back to tell others. First of all, this morning, we see a Savior who's willing to chase you down. To chase you down. You see that there in verse 3. Jesus left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. He had to pass through Samaria. The little word had to in Greek is a little word with three letters. D-E-I. It's not part of the Wook Brigade. It, It means literally something that has to happen. Something that must happen. A non-negotiable. John loves this word. He quotes Christ all the time. Jesus says in John 3, 7, you must be born again. There's that word. In John 3, 14, he says, the Son of Man must be lifted up. There's that word again. John 3, 30, John the Baptist says, I must decrease. He must increase. It's all over the place. And Jesus had to. He felt in his soul, I must pass through Samaria. Why? To bring this woman home to God. And he's come here today with the same compulsion to bring you home to God. And as he does, we see him chase her down. He crosses every kind of boundary imaginable. He, f- he crosses, first of all, a geographic boundary. Sychar, this well is up near Sychar, which is 30 miles north of Jerusalem, near Nablus in modern-day Palestine, on the West Bank. It's 30 miles. That's a day and a half's journey through rugged terrain. He goes out of Jerusalem on a hot, blistering hot day, and he walks over the mountains of Judea and the hills and down into the valleys and across rivers and up over more mountains and more valleys, For all day long he walks, he goes to bed in the frigid Middle Eastern night, gets up the next morning and walks out again to find this woman. And when he gets to the well, he's exhausted and he's thirsty, weary from his journey. He's weary. He feels the way you feel, man, when you've been out in the yard all day long, Saturday, cutting the grass, doing the edging, doing the blowing, doing the mulch maybe, you've, you've been shoveling yards of mulch for the, for the spring, and you're, you walk in, you're exhausted, you sit down on the sofa and you're wrecked and your wife says to you, she comes to you with that look in her eyes that you know is trouble, and she goes, will you help me? And you say, sure love, what, what can I do? She goes, up in the attic, <laughs> near the back, there's a couple of boxes of old clothes and there's missionaries coming to town next week and I think those old clothes, the vineyard vines and so forth, for the children that are, they've outgrown, but I think that these missionary children will love them. And you think to yourself, you said you said to her, no problem, honey. No, you don't. You say, honey, it's August in Colombia. It's 300 degrees in the attic. <laughs> <coughs> but you go because you love her. We see a savior who walks. 30 miles over the mountains and down into the valleys. He had to go to this woman. He crosses geographic boundaries. But he also crosses cultural boundaries. He goes to the Samaritans. We're told in verse 8, Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Now in God's design, the differences of race and culture were meant to be like the facets of a diamond. God is too glorious for any one race to fully radiate his glory. And so he makes all the different races. He makes the Germans and their love of engineering and details. He he makes the Asians and their their giftedness in math and music. He makes the Irish, we like to fight. Um, (laughs) I was talking to a brother I met at Twin Lakes this week. An African, young African-American lad preaching the gospel, and he was full of passion for Christ. And I, I was reminded talking about, I just love the glory of 
African culture, those noble Zulu warriors who walk with such regal majesty. Now, saying to him, you know, it's like Vody Bauckham, there's one of the best preachers in all the world, and he's gloriously black when he preaches, and a white man could never preach like that. His, his, his passion, his, his wit, his wisdom, it's glorious and it's distinctive, it's a beautiful culture. But in a fallen world, these cultural differences bring difficulty. At times, those difficulties can be a little funny. When I was a young student at RTS, the interns from, from First Press Jackson, we went off to Atlanta to a conference. First time I ever heard Alistair Begg in the flesh and R.C. Sproul. John MacArthur was there as well. It was a wonderful conference. And to kind of make the budget stretch, we stayed in this hotel in Atlanta. And we didn't realize it was a, a hotel in a different part of town and we were the only white boys there in the, t- in the hotel. And we get up in the morning, we walk down to the elevator. One of, one of the interns, Caleb, steps forward and the, wind, the doors open and the, 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 the elevator is full of these huge black men in suits. I think they were from the Atlanta Falcons or something. And they're like six foot four and five, these linebackers. And as the doors open, Caleb steps in and he kind of looks and they look down and one of them laughs and goes, boy, I thought he was in the hood. <laughs> And we laughed, we got in and had a great time chatting to them, going down for breakfast in the morning. At times, those cultural difficulties can make us uncomfortable. When I was in India as a medical student up in Chikbalapur, I went to a wedding and there was this huge kind of green leaf. They served the food on a green leaf and they came by and they kind of slopped all the food onto it. And you had to eat it with your fingers and that's not what we do. And it was, I didn't know what I was eating. I felt, I felt a little bit like Indiana Jones in the Temple of Doom when the waiter came by and lifted the head off the monkey. Monkey's brain, the delicacy. And I'm, I'm looking and thinking, what am I eating? I have no idea. And it was just, it was just a cross-cultural experience. And it's, we all have those awkwardnesses, don't we? But sometimes those cultural difficulties come wrapped up with all kinds of animosity. And that's the way it was with the Samaritans and the Jews. There was a beef between these cultures. It went back 700 years way back to when the Assyrians came down and took all the northern ten tribes off to Assyria and then repopulated the northern kingdom of Judah with, with a half-breed bunch of um, refugees. And there were some Jews left in the north and they married into this half-breed race and became the Samaritans. And they mixed a little bit of Judaism and a little bit of paganism, a little bit of idolatry, and they mixed them together in this awful place. And, and the Jews looked at Samaria as a horrible place full of horrible people, people who had compromised themselves spiritually, theologically, ecclesiastically. They despised the Samaritans. The rabbi said, he who eats bread with a Samaritan eats the flesh of a swine. If a, if a rabbi was walking down the road and a Samaritan was walking toward him, the rabbi would get into a ditch and walk in the ditch lest their shadow should touch. These are people who were so dirty, even their shadows were unclean. And Jesus goes into Samaria. Most of the Jews would never, when they went north from Judea to Galilee, they went across the river up and across again to avoid going through Samaria. But Jesus felt compelled to go, to reach out to this Samaritan. And it shouldn't surprise us, he's the darling son of heaven, and he reaches down from heaven to earth and goes right down to the gates of hell to rescue lost sinners such as you are and such as I am. He also crosses the the, the barrier of gender. Back in those days, the rabbis taught that it was unlawful for a man to greet a woman in public, even if that woman was your wife. And you get a sense of that, don't you, when Christ speaks to her in verse 9, the Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, 
Ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria, for Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. And when the disciples come back, they're similarly amazed in verse 27. The disciples come back and they marveled that he was talking with a woman. But Christ reaches across all of the boundaries, reaching out to a lost and dying world. And lastly, he reaches out across a moral boundary. This woman wasn't just any Samaritan. Did you notice? She's going to get water at noon on the sixth hour by herself. The rest of the woman, the rest of the girls went first thing in the morning, 7 a.m. And they'd go to get water together for security and for safety. But this woman goes by herself. Why? Because among these untouchable Samaritans, they regard her as untouchable. They don't want to have anything to do with her. Because she's the kind of girl who's traded her sexual purity again and again and again and again and again and again. They regard her as a stripper or a common prostitute. Do you see we've come from the top to the bottom? In the previous chapter we were in Jerusalem with Nicodemus, the teacher of Israel. And now we're with this woman that Christ has come to. And our Savior this morning, the Son of Heaven, is willing to reach out and across any of the boundaries that you might think would keep you away from him. He's willing to have you and to satisfy you. The only question is, are you willing to have him? None are excluded who do not exclude themselves. Isn't he lovely? He chases us down. Secondly, he calls us out. He's willing to call you out. See that there in verse 7. And a woman from Samaria came to draw Jesus, came to draw water. And Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself and as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. It's such a tender conversation. Here's Jesus, the one who made the oceans. The sea is his, for it was he who made it. The springs on a thousand hills belong to him. And he's asking a sinner for a drink of water. As he does, he offers her this water of life. He's calling her out for her materialism. The woman said, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty. I have to come here to drink the water. Now, in her mind, she doesn't understand what he's talking about. In her mind, she thinks he's offering her like a a faucet in the house that I no longer have to go out and draw water like an everlasting labor-saving device. She doesn't realize that Christ is taking her to another world. He's taking her behind her body and beneath her body to her soul. That she's more than just a body with a desire for food and for drink and for sex. But she's a soul that's been made by God, a soul that's been made for God. That, that, and until she knows God, the yearnings of her soul for satisfaction will never even be scratched.
Do you realize that you're more than a body? More than the dancing of your genes? More than the fizzing of your chemicals, adrenaline, noradrenaline, or epinephrine, norepinephrine, serotonin, dopamine, acetylcholine, sugar, mixing together, fizzing? That you're more than just a soup of chemicals wrapped up in a sack of skin? That you have a soul? And Christ is speaking to her soul, and he's speaking to your soul, and he's speaking of the thirst behind all of the thirst you and I have. A thirst that's deeper than the body. A thirst this world can never fill. He's offering to satisfy you with himself, right down to the core of your being. He calls out her materialism. He calls out her sin. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come here. The woman answered, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you're right in saying I have no husband. If you've had five husbands and the one you have now is not your husband, what you said is true. It's amazing when you count the number of Greek words she uses in her conversation. In verse 9, she uses 16 words. Verse 11 to 12, 41 words. Verse 15, 13 words. Jesus says to her, go call your husband. She uses three words. Have no husband. It's awkward. It's embarrassing. Why does Jesus do that? Why does he embarrass this woman? Because he's got to get to the root of the problem, do you see? He's got to get right down to this woman's habit of looking for satisfaction where satisfaction cannot be found. In her mind, she's thinking, if I can just find the right man to love me, then all will be right with the world. And she's half right and she's all wrong. Because she's looking for that man down here, below, when the only man who can satisfy the the, the, the yearnings of her heart is from above the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know that Christ knows you? He sees into your heart and into my heart. Nothing can be hidden from him. He knows all of our bull tools, all of the places you and I run to try and find satisfaction and they're empty, broken cisterns. In Jeremiah, God says, My people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. And Jesus comes to confront you and me, to call us out in our sin, that he might call us home to God. Are you looking for satisfaction where it can never be found? What does Christ know about you when he looks at you? And then he calls out her religion. And you see that there when she says, verse 19, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. That's a distraction. She's, she's trying to get the spotlight off her sin. It's like Joe Biden that time when he was running mate with um, then candidate Obama and he was on a, a stage with Obama and he leans across and there's a mic there and he drops the F-bomb and didn't realize the mic was on. And it was very embarrassing. And the next week he was at The View and Barbara Walters was asking him, what, what happened then, Joe? You know what Joe did? He laughed. And he crossed himself. But why did he do that? He was saying, I know a thing or two about religion. The F-bomb is not who I really am. I'm a man who knows how to go to church. That's what he was saying. And that's what this woman is doing. She's pulling the focus off her sin. And, and, and she's talking about, let's get back to theology. I, I, I know you're a prophet. Which mountain should we worship on? My fathers worship on this mountain, Mount Gerizim. But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where we should worship. 
And she's a wonderful example of our world that believes that as long as you have any religion, any religion will do. And that's not Jesus' opinion. Jesus says nothing in religion matters more than truth, more than salvation, and more than a personal experiential knowledge of God. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming. Neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. That's a devastating. In, in all of your religion, he says, you worship a God you do not know. Do you know you can go to church, even the right church, and worship a God you do not know? Do, do you know God? Do you know Jesus? Have you shrunk from the well of his heart and found your soul satisfied forever? We worship what we know. For salvation is from the Jews. That's awkward. He's saying to her, Samaritans, the best you can be in your Samaritan religion is lost. You must come to where God has come. You must come to where God has revealed himself. And that does not happen in most religions. It happens only in Christ. Promised in the Old Testament through the Jewish nation and revealed in the New Testament through Christ and the preaching of the Christian church. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to, be worship, to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And Christ says, he confronts her religion. You know, the best place to hide from God is in religion. In the church. To pretend to be seeking God, but actually to be hiding from him is one of the commonest things to do in church. And Christ calls her out, her materialism, thinking this world is the whole show, her sin, all of the wrong places she looks for life and satisfaction, and her religion. And lastly, and very briefly, he fills her up he seeks her out, he calls her out, and he fills her up. Verse 25, the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He who is called Christ, when he comes, he will tell us all things. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? And then in verse 39, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, it is no longer because of you. What you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the savior of the world. Oh, isn't it glorious? As Jesus comes and meets this woman. And she's come to the well with a water pot looking for water. And she leaves that water pot behind. And John draws your attention to it because he wants you to see that she's found the real water, the living water of the life-giving presence of the living God that Christ has brought her soul back to God. And she leaves the pot behind as a metaphor that she's found something much better. And this Savior is here this morning. He's here in the Word. He's here at the supper. And he's reaching out to you, young and old, rich and poor, black and white, every nation, tribe and tongue. He's reaching out from heaven across all of the cultural boundaries and spiritual boundaries that would normally keep people like you away from someone like him. And he's reaching out to you. 
And he's saying, come to me and let me fill you up with all of the fullness of God. Let me die in your place for your sins. Let me pay your debts. Let me redeem your soul. Let me be driven away from God upon the cross that I might gather you near to God through my endless love forever. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for Jesus. And this wonderful story, O Lord, that speaks of reality, our real yearning for real satisfaction, and it can be found only in Christ. Come, Lord Jesus, and minister to us and satisfy us with yourself. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let's stand this morning as we continue our worship and we'll sing to God's praise, hymn number 429. Let us stand together and sing God's praise. Amen. Please take your seats. We come this morning to the Lord's Supper. This is not a Presbyterian table. It's, a, it's the Lord's table for all of his blood-bought children. And if you are a baptized member of a church that preaches the gospel that embraces the Apostles' Creed, we welcome you to come and sit around this table this morning and to celebrate the Lord's Supper with us. For as the Apostle Paul said, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, 
When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and the blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. That's important. We're all unworthy people, but we must come in a worthy manner. We must examine ourselves to see how we need this blood and this body that's been broken and poured out for us, to see our sins. And if we're not willing to do that, we mustn't come to the table. If you're here this morning and you're holding on to sin from which you will not repent, or a broken relationship that you're not yearning to see mended, you mustn't come to the table. There can only be one broken body in this room and it's on the table that mustn't be in the congregation. Let a person examine himself then and so eat and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. If you're not yet a believer here this morning, you can't discern the body. You don't know what's going on. You don't know that this body pictures Christ's death for you, his blood shed for you. You've not been baptized. You've not come to Christ for salvation. And if you try to come to this table without coming to Christ for salvation, he will come to you in judgment. And I want to encourage you to hold back and watch and come and speak with me afterwards or one of the other pastors would be glad to talk to you about the gospel and tell you how you can believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins. Anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judged ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Let's draw near to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we thank you that there's a table for sinners to come. Unworthy sinners, damnable sinners, dirty sinners, such as I am, such as we are. And we ask you this morning, O Lord, to draw near to us in this supper and commune with us, Lord Jesus, as we seek to commune with you. We offer these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. As we prepare to meet the Lord at his table, we do so in that spirit of self-examination that Dr. Stewart mentioned from God's Word. And we do so by looking at the law of God, which is a beautiful revelation of his absolutely perfect and holy character. That is the Apostle John said, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And as we look upon the purity of God's law, we reflect upon our own unholiness, that we are those in whom there is much darkness. In fact, Our hearts prefer darkness to light because our deeds are evil. We break God's law daily in thought and word and in deed. And so let's read God's word together, God's law together, reflecting upon our dire need for God's grace daily. God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord thy God, which has brought thee out of the land of Egypt out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, 
and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. And now hear these wonderful words of assurance, gospel assurance from the Apostle John in his first epistle. We walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is the good news of the gospel. Believe it and live in its truth. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this drama of the gospel that our Lord Jesus Christ instituted to be observed in his church in a regular manner. And as we share in it, Lord, would you cause us to remember his atoning sacrifice of himself to death, wherein he was willing to become sin for us, he who knew no sin, that we might be in him the righteousness of God. And as we eat this bread, Lord, would you seal all the benefits of his death to our hungry hearts and our thirsty hearts and minds as we come in humble faith. Would you cause them to nourish us in a spiritual way, for we do come as those who are spiritually malnourished. We have a shameful appetite for spiritual junk food, and we desire to be fed real food and real drink that is the body and blood of our Lord. So as we drink this cup, would you cause us to grow together in Christ? Would you renew us? Would you re-engage us to walk daily with him, to deny ourselves, to pick up our cross daily, and to follow in the master's footsteps? Father, we now set these elements apart from a common use to a holy use, and in them may our hearts truly commune with Jesus this day as by the Spirit you raise our souls up to heaven. Thank you that he is with us now. Would you satisfy us? Would you calm the restlessness in us so that we might truly find our rest in you? For it's in the name of Jesus our Lord we pray. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me.
In the same way also, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it, all of you.
Father in heaven, we bless you for your indescribable gift <coughs> that these realities, a little thimble of juice and a little piece of shortbread, they point us to things, to one who is bigger than all the world and it came into this place, into this space and time continuum to die in our place to be condemned in our room instead and to absorb the curse of the fury of the wrath of God that we deserved. And now we get to feast on these things down here, small in the world's eyes, but how the angels gasp to see sons and daughters of Adam eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of God himself. Receive our thanks, O God, and be gracious to us as we conclude our service of worship. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand as we can finish our service this morning. Singing to God's praise, we give thanks, or we give thee thanks, O Lord. And you'll find those words printed in the back of the bulletin.
lift up your head and receive the Lord's benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up the light of his shining countenance upon you and give you peace until the day breaks and the shadows of this vain world flee away. Amen.